Hey guys, welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about one of the most common architecture patterns in both microservices and distributed systems, event-driven architecture. We'll cover what is it, when you should use it, some advantages, and a couple disadvantages. Let's dive right in. So what is event-driven architecture? Well, in a standard architecture, microservices talk to each other through APIs. Your microservice might receive a request via API, perform some action, and then make a request to another service via API. Normally, this is synchronous and every single request is blocking. A waits for B, B waits for C, C waits for D, and D completes the action. Now, this pattern is actually not that bad, and it's extremely useful if you need to return responses to users immediately. Event-driven architecture flips this model completely. Instead of calling other services directly, one service will send out an event. It follows a simple three-part pattern. Number one, the producer. This is a service where something happens. Maybe a user signs up, somebody requests a ride, somebody makes a checkout request, or maybe a payment fails. The producer does not make an API call to another service to immediately handle this. Instead, it will publish an event to a broker. The event itself is a lightweight message that described exactly what happened. Okay, the second part of the three-part pattern is the broker. This is usually a system that receives, stores, and delivers events. Some common examples of this are Kafka, Kinesis, S or even RabbitMQ. The broker is what allows you to decouple everything. And because of this, producers don't have to know how many consumers there are, exactly who those consumers are, what the consumers are gonna do with the data. All they need to do is publish the event. The broker can handle things like buffering, ordering, retries, fan out, even dead lettering in certain cases. In my mind, the broker is the heart of an event-driven architecture, which makes everything work seamlessly. And finally, we have the consumer or the services that react to events. For example, a single order placed event could trigger multiple things like a payment processing, updating, a warehouse, updating an inventory UI on the site, logging analytics, starting fraud checks. All of these could be handled by different services which independently consume that event. And these consumers can scale completely independently too. One might have one worker, another one might have 500, depending on the kind of workloads they're seeing. So here's the entire flow. A producer will produce some event, like order placed. This usually comes from a client. Next, the broker can store and deliver that event reliably. Then consumers can process that event in parallel and take whatever actions they need to take. There's no direct service to service calls, no blocking chains, and no cascading failures. The original API call can return instantly and the work can happen asynchronously. This architecture is at the backbone of so many large-scale distributed systems from things like rideshare apps to distributed IoT monitoring systems. So when should you actually use an architecture like this? Like every other decision you make in system design, there are always trade-offs and a right and a wrong time to use different patterns. As a good rule of thumb, event-driven architecture shines when you need to do a lot of things, but they don't necessarily need to happen as soon as a user makes a request. Let's break this down with a few practical examples. Imagine checkout on an e-commerce site. When somebody clicks buy, all you really have to do is validate the order and charge their credit card. Everything else like sending emails, logging analytics, and updating loyalty points can happen in the background. It doesn't need to happen before the user gets a response that their purchase was confirmed. This keeps our core request path super fast, but still makes sure that everything gets done in time. Another good reason for this type of architecture is when services need to scale independently. Maybe your email service needs 500 workers on Black Friday. Maybe your fraud detection service only ever needs one worker. Your shipping service might need five. With events, it's easy to scale each consumer based on the workload it's receiving, not the workload of the entire app. This is a huge operational win and can save you a ton of money on cost for servers. Another common reason for this is when you have natural fan out workflows. Now fan out is another super common system design pattern, but all it really means is that one event needs to trigger multiple events. For example, a rider requesting a ride on Uber. One ride created event might need to go to dispatching, ETA calculations, pricing, driver notification, analytics, all at once. If you depended on every single one of those servers to respond to you synchronously with no failure, is, well, I don't think your users would be very happy with that. Now, the last two reasons I'll mention are when you want to build for resilience and you want it to be extremely easy to extend your system in the future. In an event-driven system, events can queue up, consumers can retry, failures are caught gracefully in a dead letter queue, things can scale independently, and usually the system can recover by itself pretty gracefully. In a synchronous system, one system going down can usually take down your entire request pipeline because everything depends on each other. And these systems are super easy to evolve because you can always add another consumer and it doesn't affect the producers. If you want to add an ML model or a dashboard or another notification service, it's as easy as just hooking it up to the broker. Trust me, the last thing you want is to work on a system where the microservices are strongly coupled and you have to add or remove something. Gigantic pain. Okay, before you go propose a new event-driven system to your team, let me tell you about all the disadvantages that come with this, because there are quite a few. The first is that debugging becomes a lot harder. In a standard synchronous architecture, you can look at a single request, follow the entire stack trace, see exactly what failed, and find the bug pretty quickly. In an event-driven system, a failure could occur in a lot more places. In the producer, in the 
broker and one of six consumers in the retries, in the dead letter queue. You have to look through all these places and track down a single event through that entire process. If you don't have great observability, this can quickly turn into a nightmare. Tracking the actual flow of a request requires distributed tracing, correlation IDs, and extremely good logging hygiene. This is expensive and difficult to achieve. Now, the second thing is that this introduces eventual consistency. Events are asynchronous, which means that updates don't appear everywhere instantly. For example, a customer places an order, but it doesn't immediately reflect in their loyalty points. This might take a couple seconds, a couple minutes, or even a couple hours. In the average case, nobody really cares. But in the worst case, the customer emails you asking where their points are, and you have to track down exactly what happened. Now you have to worry about stale reads, race conditions, out of order events, when maybe all you need to do is wait another five minutes. Again, good logging will be hugely helpful here, but it's also helpful to make sure you have things like item potency keys and versioning implemented correctly. Number three, operational complexity increases. Instead of having one service directly call another one, and all you're worried about is the APIs and the servers, now you have to worry about the broker too. You have to handle scaling of the broker, managing things like topic retention policies, and making sure that it remains healthy throughout the entire process. Anytime you add another component to a system, you're adding operational overhead, both to manage and while you're on call. It's also harder for newer engineers to onboard. Pretty much every engineer I've worked with can easily manage a single synchronous API. Distributed event-driven systems get confusing super quickly. You need to have extremely clear ownership models over different pieces of the system and excellent documentation detailing exactly where different pieces of data come from and go so that people can understand how the system works as a whole. And lastly, you can end up with higher latency for critical paths. A lot of the time, you do need to have some synchronous events coupled with your asynchronous events. In any of the examples I use, you need to make sure that a payment is validated before handling everything else asynchronously. This brings up questions like, what happens if the payment fails? Should I send the event or not? Or what if my consumers fails, but I've already charged their credit card? All more complexity that you now have to manage. Good event-driven architecture does give you incredible scalability and resilience, but it comes at the cost of vastly increased complexity. You must invest in observability, documentation, and make sure you use extremely good patterns when you go with this kind of architecture. Otherwise, this becomes way harder to manage than the monolith that you just retired. If you want to learn more about system design with both real world examples and practical deep dives like this, follow my channel. You'll love everything I have here. And if you want to read and get something in your inbox once a week or so, you can grab my free newsletter down below.